그래 지난 주에 previously 뭐 했는지 as usual. Okay, let's let's go over uh, what we learned and discuss last week. Uh, we uh, we were talking about foreign policy analysis scholarship, for, uh, FPA scholarship, right? Which is quite different from the mainstream theoretical perspectives we've learned so far. Right? And these are the um, some of the questions that uh, we uh, consider, right? And core readings here, Taeyeon Usung, okay, gave a presentation about FPA. And let me give you some of the key points or important points regarding foreign policy analysis scholarship, okay, such as the main arguments and assumptions and premises underlining uh, FPA scholarship, right? So, uh, first, a key level and unit of analysis. 여기까지 했지만, 모두 다 알겠죠, 그죠? The key level of analysis or key unit of analysis taken by FPA scholars is, 그렇지? Individual, individual uh, human beings or individual decision makers, right? Individual decision makers. So basically, uh, foreign policy analysis scholars focus on specific actors, very specific actors, uh, mainly state governments and state leaders or national leaders who actually make uh, decisions and choices. And also they focus on the decision making processes, okay, by which such decisions are made. So broadly speaking, uh, their focus is placed on domestic politics or uh, what's going on within the government, whereas the mainstream uh, theories tend to ignore, right, tend to ignore what's going on within the government or within the minds of the state leaders, so on and so forth. Uh, because, hmm? because, because, you know, in Russia, there is, uh, according to mainstream uh, theoretical perspectives, we, uh, uh, in IR, in the field of international relations, there is no need for us to examine in detail individual decision makers or decision making processes. Because, because, I'm pretty sure you know the answer here, right? Because uh, you already done some of the discussion regarding these questions. Where? There are too many constraints on the decision making. What constraint? constraints? Constraints to making, rely on the making of making the decision. Mm. Across the across the point, a point to issue or mm. if diplomatic to issue. Mm. Okay, so that's why we are allowed to sort of ignore uh, the individual decision makers and their their roles and their personal characteristics and beliefs. Is I'm, that? I'm mm -mm. That's right. That's that's the key point. That's the key point. Right? <laughs> rationality. The notion of rationality is under serious challenge by foreign policy analysis scholarship. Although mainstream theorists tend to believe that state leaders think and behave in a rational manner, right? That's the key. 이게 가장 중요한 거기 때문에. 그래서 according to uh, uh, mainstream theories uh, with or based on uh, the notion of rationality or with the premise of the notion of uh, rationality, we could consider all, right, <laughs> all decision makers, all political leaders uh, to be alike, okay, to be same, uh, in the sense that all of us, especially political leaders in charge of this state, <laughs> think and act in the same way uh, rationally, meaning rationally, uh, trying to have or increase power uh, relative to other states or economic benefits or increase uh, interest in international uh, relations. So in other words, all decision makers are considered as rational actors. And therefore, they have or they believe to have okay, the same operating motivation in IR, okay, such as the increasing power or maintaining VOP, balance of power, 
or economic uh, gains. Okay. So uh, based on this logic, uh, it is fruitful for us to conceptualize a state as a rational unitary uh, actor or treat what takes place within the state as a black box. Okay, black box. 우리가 in Korean으로 하면은 암상자 처리한다고 하지 사실은 그렇죠? 암상자 처리한다고 아, 우리가 what's going on within the state 하는 것을 볼 필요가 없는 암상자처럼 처리해도 되는 것이죠. Uh, so individual decision makers is uh, uh, is uh, regarded as an unimportant um, factor or actor of international relations or foreign policy or diplomacy according to uh, rational choice theory, which uh, is uh, related to mainstream theoretical perspectives. But instead, what's going on? What is outside the state, such as such as the how material capability are distributed at the international system, or the level of economic interdependence, or the whether, uh, or to what extent international institutions are spread, and what kinds of international norms exist, and so on and so forth. Tapio Chodiga, liberalism, constructivism, and realism, as well. International norms, international institutions, and the balance of power, and so on and so forth. Uh, come in very important um, factors of international politics, as well as foreign policy decision making uh, according to the mainstream view of IR. So in this sense, right, uh, foreign policy analysis scholarship is very distinguishable right, from the other uh, theoretical perspectives we've learned so far um, because they do not, uh, they tend to focus on individual decision makers and decision making processes, not larger structural or systemic uh, elements, uh, but here is a very important uh, distinction, okay? Obviously, there are some of the important uh, debates and discussion outside uh, the foreign policy analysis scholarship that argue for the importance of domestic factors as well. I mean, it is not foreign policy analysis scholarship alone uh, arguing for or arguing that we need to focus more on domestic politics, individual makers. There are another group of scholars in the field of international relations who argue that we need to pay more attention or careful attention to domestic politics such as the uh, democratic peace theory. Okay? According to democratic peace theory, we need to examine carefully different regime types because depending on what types of regime we have, we live in, uh, different foreign or security behavior we could expect you know, regarding peace and war. Okay? So again, according to a democratic peace theory, we need to also uh, pay attention to domestic politics. But the important distinction here is this: okay, uh, the most of work outside, okay, outside of the FPA scholarship has emphasized the importance of domestic structure, such as the regime types, okay, uh, and national society at the at the expense of at the expense of rather than individual or individuality individual personality, individual policy, uh, or political beliefs, or characteristics, or leadership types, and so on. Okay. So here is a clear distinction between the uh, democratic peace theory and, again, foreign policy analysis scholarship. Okay. Although both of them tend to regard uh, what's going on within states as important factor affecting international relations. Uh, so uh, FPA treats cognitive, more specifically they regard cognitive and psychological aspects of individual decision makers as important causal factors of foreign policy and diplomacy, such as the uh, personal characteristics or political and social beliefs held by individual decision makers are very, very important. Uh, within the field, within the uh, scholarship of foreign policy uh, analysis. Okay? Uh, in this sense, FPA is often described as agent-centered or agent-centric or agent or actor-specific theory because uh, they focus on not just individuals no, but their personal, their personal characteristics and psychology and cognitive uh, aspects. Okay? 
So here is the uh, table that shows the comparison that does the comparison uh, between realism and foreign policy analysis scholarship. Okay. So as you can see here, main actors, uh, according to realism, is states, whereas foreign policy analysis uh, focus on individual system makers and small uh, decision making groups, elite groups, to be more precise, and bureaucratic organizations. And just take a look at the central assumptions here, central assumptions. Okay. So realism uh, has the assumption or belief that states as unitary rational actors rationally act with the same operating motivation in the anarchy international system. Therefore, we don't have to pay serious attention to individual or individualities of decision makers. But according to uh, FPA, uh, human decision makers, basically decision makers are human beings, right? And we do not uh, act rationally, not necessarily rationally, right? So human decision makers are not uh, best approximates as uh, rational actors equivalent to uh, the state, right? And all events occurring uh, between states of, and across states are byproducts of human decision makers acting on behalf of the state in the name of the state, right? So based on these central assumptions, uh, they do have different arguments. They do have different arguments, especially uh, when it comes to how to explain, how best to explain uh, foreign policies and international uh, events. So realism argues that or um, asks us to look into the structure of the international system, whereas foreign policy analysis scholarship uh, requires us to look into uh, the individual decision makers and decision making uh, processes. So let me uh, uh, explain a bit uh, more detail about one of the uh, well-established research programs that exists uh, within the foreign policy analysis scholarship, which is often called cognitive, okay, cognitive foreign policy analysis or cognitive consistency theory of foreign policy. Okay. So as I said before, FPA basically treat cognitive or psychological aspects of individual decision makers as important causal factor, factors that affect, influence, impinge upon state behavior, right, uh, in global politics. Uh, so uh, central arguments are very uh, straightforward here. So in order for us to have uh, satisfactory explanation and, and understanding of why states behave as they do, we have to, okay, we have to view the situation or the event through the eyes of those who act in the name of the state, okay? Through the eyes of, the, of those who act in the name of the state. Because first, again, as I said, we human beings, decision makers, including decision makers, do not necessarily act in a rational manner. I mean, we do act sometimes in a rational manner, but we do not, right? Uh, at other times, so necessarily, n not necessarily act rationally all the times. So rather, uh, according to cognitive consistency theory or psycholo psychological analysis uh, studies, human beings or decision makers, human decision makers view their environment differently and more importantly, this is very important, they operate within, okay, within their own psychological environment. Okay? They operate they believe, they think, they make decisions within their own psychological uh, environment. In other words, uh, decision makers, human decision makers perceive their surrounding environments and make inferences and decisions based on their subjective beliefs. Because okay? uh, they operate within their own psychological uh, environment, right? Uh, Therefore, uh, decision makers plan strategies and make decisions that confirm with their own uh, beliefs, all right? So, uh, cognitive scholars focus on identifying in this regard, okay, decision makers' beliefs or images through which they perceive and interpret uh, the situation and the issue facing uh, them. And more specifically, the decision makers perceive and simplify the reality of the social and political world 
on the basis of their subjective mm. beliefs. Okay, so all of us know that uh, we are facing very uh, the world we are facing is very complex, right? Complex and complicated. So in a way or another, we have to or we are engaged in simplifying the complex reality. And in the process of simplifying the complex reality, we often engage in subjective beliefs. We simplify the words. We simplify the incoming information on the basis of what we believe uh, regarding the social and political uh, reality. That's why uh, cognitive theorists believe that subjective beliefs or so images we have toward the state or toward the situation work as something like screens or filters okay through which lots of information are filtered right and selected okay so uh, decision makers tend to fit in common information into uh, their subjective beliefs right so as i said beliefs here work as filters or uh, screens and this process of filtering or screening is some extent necessary uh, given the fact that the uh, decision makers, especially top decision makers, face the sheer volume of data they have to deal with every uh, day. Okay, so let me uh, okay let me show you a very interesting uh, diagram here that could help you understand better understand how decisions are uh, uh, made. Okay, in reality, in practice. Uh, uh, from the perspective of the mainstream theoretical uh, perspectives, decisions are believed to be uh, made in this way, okay? Decision maker, we have decision makers here. And then decision makers uh, assess and analyze, evaluate all of the information related to the situation or issue in hand, right? Objectively, impartially, right? Because of decision makers, including us, are rational actors, okay? We rationally engage in the so-called cost and benefit analysis, and analyzing all of the relevant information. And then we make decisions, or we choose decisions in favor of something that could help us increase our power relative to other states, or, uh, or, or decisions that could help us to have uh, economic benefits, and so on and so forth. So this is uh, rational, this is uh, described as rational decisions, and here we have rational actors. Okay. Right. But uh, according to FPA, and in particular, cognitive theory of FPA, uh, in reality, decisions are being made very different, in a very different manner, right? So decision makers here, just assess and evaluate all of the relevant information. But according to cognitive theory of foreign policy analysis, decision makers first have the perceive and, like I said, simplify, right? And assess and analyze the incoming information or informi relevant information based on their subjective beliefs, their political orientations, and maybe their uh, personality and their uh, established images toward the other states, such as the, the image we have toward Japan or the United States, right? So based on the images and beliefs we have, we analyze, assess, evaluate the relevant information, okay? So this is not a rational uh, process of the uh, decision making, right? So uh, information, that fits uh, their beliefs and images, okay? So information only comes through this uh, uh, belief system or image systems. And therefore, the final decisions is likely, are likely to be consistent with uh, the beliefs and images that they already uh, held, right? Because uh, they assess, evaluate the information based on their subjective beliefs. And therefore, they tend to select the only information that consists, the consistent with their uh, beliefs and, and images. Okay, so this is decisions. Uh, the decisions here are often described as non-rational or psychological decisions. Okay, psychological decisions or non-rational decisions. And here, these are makers uh, 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 called as the cognitive misers. Okay, cognitive misers. 
as, as opposed to rational actors. Okay. 저는 인코이안 라멘을 인지적 구두쇠라고 하죠 사실은 인지적 구두쇠라고 해서 그래서 쇼컷을 받는다는 거야. 그러니까 모든 정보를 다 그냥 우리가 어세스하는 게 아니라 우리가 갖고 있는 개별적인 정치적 신념이나 이미지에 따라서 정보를 셀렉트하고 거기에 따라서 평가를 하기 때문에 결과적으로는 구두쇠처럼 정보를 어, 다 평가하는 게 아니라 구두쇠처럼 정보를 평가하고 프로세스하고 인식하기 때문에 커그네티브 마이저라고 하는 거죠. 인지적 구두쇠라고 하는 so, 이런 이름을 붙인다라고 하는 거고 So as I said, believes images here work as screen or filter This whole, the whole process is often described as schema 아마 들어봤을 수도 있고 In political psychology에서 많이 나온 얘기죠. 스키마라고 한다. So 차이를 알겠죠. There is a clear distinction, difference between um, rational decision making processes often accepted as the normal process uh, within mainstream thinking, within the mainstream thinking. 이거랑 이 FPA에서 생각하는 것과 이런 차이가 있다는 거 알겠죠? 그죠? So, uh, although these makers may believe that they are being very rational and strictly impartial, but in a very real way, their rationality is bounded. So, bounded rationality is one of the key concepts employed by FPA scholars. Uh, they cannot uh, assess all the relevant information simply. Mm? Instead, they take a shortcut okay, based on their subjective beliefs. And also, they tend to uh, avoid, they tend to try to avoid cognitive dissonance. Uh, therefore, they let, they tend to let in information that only fits their existing, pre-existing beliefs and keeping out information that does not uh, fit of their pre-existing beliefs or images for cognitive consistent, consistency. And this can be done, of course, uh, through a variety of methods, selective perception, selective perceptions and reinterpretation, or under and over estimation of the incoming information. Okay. Mm, so to sum up uh, FPA and cognitive analysis, I mean, first, the focus is placed on individual, right, individual, human, agents acting on behalf of the states in the name of the states. Right? So first, the first point, uh, the first important point regarding MPA is the individual makers um, do matter. And second point, uh, individual decision makers cannot be treated as rational actors who have the same uh, behavioral motivation in international um, politics. Okay. Uh, because first, they do not necessarily act rationally, and second, they uh, engage in selective uh, choice and reinterpretation and over and under estimation of the information based on their subjective beliefs, right? According to consistent uh, theory, according to it. Right? Uh, therefore, for policy analysis, scholars in general focuses on specific actors. Uh, whereas the mainstream IR uh, tend to ignore. And FPA treats cognitive and psychological aspects as important causal uh, factors. Uh, there are lots of, uh, uh, quite a number of uh, limitations and shortcomings of foreign policy analysis scholarship. Uh, very obvious. What's mm -hmm. 여러분들 지루하니까 한번 물어보자. 응? 뭐가 있을까? So what are the limitations? What are the uh, limitations of uh, FPA? 뭐가 있을까? 다 알겠지 이제. FPA가 뭘 중요하게 생각하는지. 그리고 어떻게 해서 어떤 논리로 인디비주얼을 음, 보는 것이 적절한지에 대한 논리를 우리는 지금 알수 있을 텐데 상당히 설득력이 있음에도 불구하고 어떤 리미테이션이 있는데 뭐가 있을까요? What are the limitations of FPA? 응. 
mm. and their political interests, mm. everything is different. So there are so many constraints, mm. and it's just going to be really hard and unrealistic to analyze every every part of every kind of uh, constraint. It's just uh, relying on uh, it's related to the uh, FDA. Mm, mm. Good job. That is the one of the methodological challenge that FDA faces. Okay, right. it's a uh, very difficult to. Mm, examine, let alone, let alone compare all of the uh, different decision makers' personalities or political beliefs methodologically, right? But again, uh, we now have very advanced computer-based uh, anal analytical method, right, that we could utilize when it comes to uh, uh, identifying individual decision makers' uh, political beliefs and personalities so uh, there is a tool we have, but yeah, there is a fair point because uh, uh, methodological change. Okay, so what else more is going? Except for the methodological change that FPA uh, is facing, what else the uh, limitations are there regarding FPA? What is going to? 단순하게 생각해, 아주 단순하게, simply, simply. 단순하게 우리가 FPA 하면은 가장 먼저 떠오르는 거는 이제 individual decision makers and domestic politics and their individual decision makers personalities and political beliefs 이것만 얘기하는데 그러다 보면 역시 그래 음음 음. That's right 음 Exactly. I think that's why it's very mm. It's not that we cannot just analyze one person. Mm, exactly, exactly. Mm. That's the, uh, probably uh, the biggest or the greatest challenge that FPA faces, okay? And this is something we already, you guys have already discussed uh, last week when you uh, did a group discussion. Uh, namely, the uh, decision makers are not free agents, right? There are lots of... Uh, uh, constraints placed upon individual decision makers, especially in democratic states, as Emily has just pointed out, right? There are lots of constraints, including uh, the international, international constraints, right? Let alone domestic constraints, right? But uh, again, FPA, just like the uh, uh, mainstream analysis, mainstream IL theory, tend to ignore what's going on outside the state. Rather, they focus on what's going on within the state or inside the state, right? And that is the uh, biggest challenge. So lots of constraint by international and domestic, external and internal. <coughs> Structural conditions surrounding them, for example, 뭐가 있을까? 우리 지난주에 다 얘기했죠. Constraint. 되게 많잖아. 그렇죠? 그래서 다 토론을 우리가 했기 때문에 아마 알 거야. 뭐 많이 있지. 그치? 뭐 public opinion, 아까 에밀리가 얘기한 public opinion도 있을 수가 있고 또뭐 우리가 흔히 얘기하는 규범 같은 것들이 있어요. Social norm or international 국제 규범, 사회 규범 뭐 있고 또 institutional constraint 있을 수가 있죠. 그러니까 President and Prime Minister alone cannot make a decision at all the times, right? 그러니까 institutional checking 같은 것들이 또 있기 때문에 institutional constraint, international norms, domestic norms, public opinion, and politicians are very very concerned about the possibility of re-election, the next election. 이런 얘기 우리가 지난주에 계속 했었잖아. 그치? 음. 그런 것들을 고려하지 않은 상태에서 Is it okay for us to just focus on the personality and, and political beliefs held by decision makers? 막 이렇게 이제 얘기를 하는 거죠. 음. 다 알겠지? 음, 그래. 좋았어. 너네들 똑똑하니까. So uh, what this implies is quite straightforward and obvious, right? That is, we gotta, okay, we need to employ some sort of a multiple or multi-level or multi-factorial analytical framework, right? Associated with both the individual uh, factors as well as the international domestic structural factors and conditions. It's precisely because the factors that uh, belong to the both or different levels of analysis surely affect the uh, formulation of foreign policy analysis and thereby international uh, relations, okay? 
And this suggests for the study of international relations foreign policy is that, um, like I said, multi-level analysis framework is required. And more importantly, we have to think uh, very carefully about how to make a multi-level or multi-factor analytical framework, you know, theoretical or analytical integration. That's a, that's a tough call, right? But, uh, you know, this is something we, uh, we will think um, about again and again and again throughout uh, this semester, okay? Methodologically, how to make a theoretical or analytical integration, because uh, we do know that multiple factors and different levels of analysis do matter, uh, but uh, in a systemic way, how could, we, how could we employ and apply such a complex and multiple, uh, multi-level analytical framework in, uh, in an empirical uh, analysis, okay? Uh, I don't have an answer, you don't have an answer, that, that's fine, because okay, uh, we will think about it um, throughout the semester. Right? Okay, uh, 여기까지고, um, on, that, on that note, today we will uh, talk uh, critical about critical theory in relation to IR, right? And as you know by now, APA, Foreign Policy Analysis Scholarship, is not a major theoretical perspective accepted by the scholars of international relations. Okay? It is a, one of the, how to say, soft field okay, of the larger field of international relations. Foreign Policy Analysis Scholarship is certainly not a mainstream perspective in the field of IR, right? And most of the same can be said about critical theory, right? Critical theory is not Amazing. I mean, it remains at the margin of the margin of IR community, although uh, uh, there is a growing interest and attention paid to uh, critical theory, but uh, what can we be so certain about is the fact that critical theory is, is a very, is something that remains still at the margins of, of IR. Uh, probably that's why we, uh, it is worth, uh, 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 thinking hard about, right? And these are the, some of the uh, questions, okay? For example, what are the main arguments of critical theory? And more importantly, uh, in what sense is critical theory different from uh, mainstream theoretical perspectives and approaches in IR? Uh, the difference, okay, major differences between critical theory and and the other theoretical perspectives, including realism, liberalism, constructivism, and even and foreign policy analysis scholarship. Okay? And here, uh, I think you need to think uh, or recall uh, what we learned in the first week of the uh, semester, right? The first uh, meeting, seminar meetings. There are different types of the theory, and different types of theory do different things, right? And just recall, or can recall uh, what we talk and discuss in the first week. And uh, what would be the virtue, virtues of critical theory? And do you think we need critical theory? Um, again, critical theory remains at the margin, okay? It's not a mainstream uh, theoretical perspective in the field of IR. Uh, then we need to think about why, okay? Why critical theory still remains at the margins of, of IR, okay? Although critical theory was introduced to IR back in 1980s, okay? So it's more than, it's more than 30 years, okay? It's more than 30 years that we uh, came to know the critical theory in the field of IR, but still, it's a minor, okay? It's not a major, a mainstream view. And uh, until 2007, uh, okay, until 2007, yes, just four, just four percent of the all American IL scholars use critical theory. Okay, so the rest of the American political American scholars of international relations uh, rely on the the, the, the three okay, mainstream theoretical perspective: realism, liberalism, and constructivism. Okay? And but. Uh, it is the um, it is just justifiable. That's the question. And do you prefer uh, critical theory to so-called problem-solving uh, theory in the study of international relations and foreign policy? And the shortcomings, of course, critical theory. Equal. And this this is the uh, this is core reading. 바로 하기보다는 우리 짧게 그렇죠? Let's take a very short break. 
어, 오늘 할 거는 이제 크리티컬 시리 어, in relation to IR 이라고 하는 주제로 발표를 우리 어, 헤드스 진솔 그 다음에 형원이 어, 하게 되는 거잖아요. 그죠? 그래서 잘 준비가 되어 있다고 믿고 싶고 어, <웃음> 그래 어, 아까 얘기한 이런 퀘스천들에 대해서 생각을 좀 해보면 좋을 것 같은데 잠깐 얘기한 것처럼 uh, Before we uh, go into get into the uh, um, uh, presentation to be given by uh, these three guys um, Let me remind you of what we learned and discussed at the first week of this semester right? The different types of the a theory uh, do exist in the field of international relations, right? And different theories are doing very different kinds of things. And that's the first core reading, uh, the paper written by Tim Jen, Hansen, and Colin White, right? And so far, we have learned realism, liberalism, and conventional constructivism, okay? Uh, like I said, there are different kinds of constructivism. We have uh, conventional constructivism, and we have the critical constructivism, we have postmodern constructivism, different kinds of constructivism uh, do exist. Uh, but we learn, what we learn and focus on was a conventional, in other words, Wentian, went, cons the constructivism uh, by went, right? And uh, so, the, uh, the uh, including foreign policy analysis scholarship that we learned last week, okay? So all of the uh, four theoretical approaches are described or could be described as explanatory, explanatory three, because uh, the main concern, the primary concern of their, uh, or, or the, uh, the four uh, theoretical approaches uh, is to find out general causes, right? They are interested in why questions. Like I said, why states behave as they do, right? And they try to explain the why question. For example, realism tries to explain why question by focusing on the balance of power, power transition, the different types of power. And re liberalism tries to explain why question by focusing on international institutions and then so forth. And conventional constructivism, pay attention to international norms, the construction of, construction of international norms. And whereas foreign policy analysis scholarship tries to understand the why question by focusing on individual decision makers, right? But today, uh, we have a different type of theory in the field of international relations in particular, and in social sciences more generally, right? That is the critical, critical theory, right? Critical theory. So uh, different uh, aims here, right? So we need to pay very careful attention to what kinds of aims or what kinds of purposes that critical theory would like to achieve, right? As compared with uh, the other mainstream theoretical approaches. I get you? Don't want to go Different, okay, different uh, aims and different purposes are pursued by different types of theory, right? So that's uh, one of the key, very important points that you need to keep in mind, okay, before we uh, uh, allow these three guys to uh, give a presentation about critical theory, and also think about which one between you know, different aims of theory, okay, which one would you uh, prefer, especially when it comes to studying international relations, okay, and foreign policy. Okay, we do know different types, different aims, but among them, which one do you prefer if you have to make a choice given the limited, given the fact that we have very limited intellectual resources at our disposal, right? So we have to make a choice. We have to prioritize. And given that, which one would you take uh, to uh, the study of international relations? That's the another second very important question that I want you to think hard uh, today before you go home. Right, uh, come forward and do this. Okay, hello, we are group seven who prepare critical theory uh, called Bipaniron in Korean. And I am Jinsol, and this is Hyungwon, and this is Hezos. And index. Uh, 
I will present about introduction to critical theory, and Hyun-won will introduce case studies about critical theory, like Bandung Conference, Suez Crisis, 911 Terror, and so on. And it has just very into the flow of our flow of our thoughts and crit criticism to of critical theory. Okay. Yep. What is critical theory is it is a theory about social revolution and emancipation that criticize mainstream theories like realism and liberalism. Uh, anyway, it argues that the theory cannot be separated from practice and cannot be value natural. Uh, okay. First of critical theory. We can find the origin of critical theory from classical Greeks and Kant, Hegel, Marx, Fox did, and nowadays Frankfurt School leads the critical theory. Especially Horkheimer, Adorno, and Habermas. Mm, their theory called discourse ethics. It says that by thinking based on discourse ethics, people can communicate without limitation and find out what is improper. Then we will compare mainstream theories and critical theory. First, mainstream theories about think, think about objective knowledge is, exists, but critical theory thinks that none exists because knowledge is conditioned by historical or social context. And mainstream theories think the aims of theory is simply explaining international relations. But critical theory criticizes relation, international relations and tries to change, fr change the frame itself of it, as it believes that discourses can change it, like Habermas and Adorno. Uh, how the critical theory criticizes the mainstream theories and international relations. It says that mainstream theories ignore the world's problems rather promotes. First, the realism says that it is natural that the powerful states affect or rule the weak states. But critical theory says that it can be used to justify the order-based power. Second, liberalism says that we should enhance in the interdependence and accelerate globalization. But criticized theorists think that globalization makes polarization of wealth and voice. It leads the dependence theory, and dependence theory means that colonies, especially in Latin America, cannot be developed because of their predominant states like Western, Western European states. <sighs> okay. Let me introduce that how critical theory says that how can we overcome the hegemonic reality? Hegemonic reality consists of dominance based on power and cons and consensus of the members. Critical theory con concentrates on the second, the consent of the members. They are there are two methods to overcome the hegemonic reality. The first is powerful movements. Critical theorists think that each people can present a united front against the hegemonic power, like trade union, NGOs, etc. And discourse ethics from Frank school, Frankfurt School, especially Habermas. It tries to take everyone's opinion related to such issue, like polarization, into account through discussion and communication. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> And next, Hyun-won will introduce all about, about our case studies. Well, okay, my name is Hyun-won, as you all know. And the professor promised us that if we, uh, after we finish the presentation, and we're gonna postpone the further discussion to the next class, so this is gonna be <laughs> like, uh, th after this presentation, this class will be end. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pursue my fastest pace <laughs> for common goods as always. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I prepare for several case studies for related to critical theories. Critical theories shows deep interest to the possibility of change and transformation of world orders, which causes injustice 
polarization and racism. And there will be many other problems caused by, ma caused by fun uh, fundamental orders of the world. And this can be, this can be countered by emancipatory counter-hegemonic forces. These forces are states, counter-hegemonic alliance, and new social movement. In case of states, there will be it will be a coalition of those world, and I prepared the case of Bandun Conference and Suez Crisis. For counter-hegemonic alliance, I prepared the case, case for 911 and Greenpeace, which is a non-governmental organization. And for a new social movement, I prepared the case of Inping Network, which will be quite strange for all of us. It's, it's, a, farm, it's a farming network created in Thailand. And critical theory also ultimately aims to enhance state into cosmopolitan community based on discourse ethics. Discourse ethics, which takes decision, takes everyone's opinion related to this, uh, decision making into account, and uh, it means that it is tried to prove that just justice is different by as Linklater said. For the case of cosmopolitan cosmopolitan community, I prefer the case of Schengen system of European Union. First, the Bandung Conference. It is the Asian African Conference constituted of 29 countries. The 50, it contained 55% of world population, but only 8% of world income was related to that. And it was defi definitely the coalition of the world, which was the, actually, the notion of the world came up from this conference. And it aimed to, uh, to end colonialism and build intimate relationship between Asian and African countries. And its achievement is resulted in 10 principles of peace. The 10 principles of peace is a pursuit of per is the peace possible, a peaceful coexistence free from ideological conflicts between capitalism and communism. It also focused on anti-imperialism, anti-colonialism, and um, okay, the, the anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism, which was the Definitely against the, the present hegemony that at that time, like U.S. and U.S.S.R. The significance, which can be known from the, this case study, is is definitely a momentum of the enlargement of international movement by the third world, and it led to many other movements by the third world, such as such as Swiss crisis. But according to the critical theory, it also had kind of a limitation. It failed to mediate a different national interest in the, in the third world. For example, it caused kind of territorial disputes between China and India which in the area of called Aksai Chen. And next is Swiss crisis. After the Bandung conference, Nasser became, uh, Nasser who was the president of the Egypt, became, became a kind of a powerful leader of the Middle East Asia. And with this uh, political confidence, he nationalized Swiss Canal, previously owned by Britain and France. Britain and France was obviously very furious about that, but he, they could not uh, start war immediately because of the uh, international atmosphere, which was uh, very familiar to which was very familiar to Egypt. So they drew Israel over to their side and waged war against Egypt. But as I said, international atmosphere was very favorable to Egypt. So UN and USSR supported Egypt. And even US, which was usually favorable to Israel, also supported Egypt. So there are the Britain, US, uh, US uh, Britain, I mean, France, and Israel had no other choice but withdrawing from Egypt. This has kind of significance that, mm, it is definitely true that Egypt got defeated in battle, but he, but Nasser, uh, Nasser won in the not won victory over war, so it resulted in the success to nationalize Suez Canal, and it stimulated other colonized countries, other control of Europe, especially in case of Africa. So the independence movement of, of Africa it has begun from the Suez Crisis, and the many African countries uh, achieved independence. It started from Ghana in 1957 of Kwame Nkrumah, and there's a year called the Year of Africa, which was in 1960, and around 70 countries in Africa uh, achieved independence at once. 
but it also had kind of limitation that it could not restrain kind of composition of the international society, which was dominated by hegemony of hegemony of USSR and US, because it because US originally supported Israel, which was originally against Egypt, and Egypt started to get support from the USSR. It means that the Cold War also enlarged into the Middle East Asia. And for the case, and now I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to continue for the case study about counter hegemonic alliance. Actually, the case of 911 is very famous to all of you, so I'm not going to explain that long about that. But the thing, uh, the the building which has been attacked by the terrorists was World Trade Center and Pentagon, which was definitely a symbol of capitalism and U.S. hegemony. That and the terrorist pursued attack. To, uh, to pursue kind of a challenge against this kind, this hegemony, and after the and the significance and the limitation of this is quite obvious that it's the kind it's the counter counter movement against contemporary contemporary hegemonic powers like U.S. and it's also a trial to transform or destroy fundamental orders of the international society. But it also has a limitation that. It failed to break down current international orders, but it proved solid hegemony of U.S. And the death of bin Osama bin Laden also proved that. And again, this is also the example of the counter hegemonic alliance. In this case, is the non-governmental organization, Greenpeace. Greenpeace is the, as I said, it's a non-governmental organization which focused on uh, anti-nuclear experiment and whale fishery and environmental protection. It's a, it started from the 12 social activists, which were originally a normal civilians. Its contribution and it has succeeded to contribute to the conclusion of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty against the nuclear experiment against the nuclear experiment by UN. Actually, this Greenpeace was now known as the very mild and peaceful uh, peaceful groups, but they were originally known as uh, their, they, their movements were very originally known as very radical and violent. Such as they try they try to track the nuclear nuclear experiment uh, checked by the uh, done by France and U.S. U.S. or U.S.S.R. and they have been almost been shot by the U.S. and U.S.S.R. command commando. But with this kind of achievement. They succeeded a kind of historical achievement against nuclear experiment by civilians, with, uh, and it's definitely a bottom-up movement in the civil society, which critical theory favors. And it's also a, suc a successful case of civil movements against hegemonic countries like U.S. and U.S.S.R. But it also has a kind of limitation that it's the non-governmental organization, which is a bit far from the political and economical changes, and. Mm, a political and economic revolution, which the critical theory essentially desires. Mm. And this is the case for the new social movement. Maybe uh, m many of you would know would wouldn't know that much about this case. This is the impact network in the Thailand. First, I when I studying the c critical theory, I thought that. The escape or the challenge towards the capital capitalism is also can be a kind of case for the uh, critical theory. So I try to find kind of a self-sufficient movements against the capitalism. So the, what I found was the impact network, in, impact network in Thailand. It was a community of 4,000 farmers in Thailand, and it is originated from Thailand Rural Reconstruction Movement, which was from 1969 to 1976. And it desired and aimed coexistence and cooperation in the agriculture. Now, what I is truly intended was this kind of self-sufficient economy, almost completely separated from capitalist economy. Its production was mainly focusing on self-consuming, and it did not produce to earn economical profit. And only surpluses, which is left after consuming, are allowed to be sold in public markets. The importance which the impact network gives is 
is the trial to see economic dependence as peripheral groups or in core groups. It's depending, it, related to the, it can be explained according to the dependency theories that the peripheral groups are completely, uh, can, can never grow because of the core, uh, core groups, uh, because of the dominance of the core groups. And also, it has an attempt to build new orders free from current capitalist economic system. And in the point of critical theory, it can also be referred as the bottom of movement from the civil society. But it also has a limitation that its scale and system is not yet uh, well developed enough to substitute the capitalist economy. And this is going to be our last case study that for the cosmopolitan community, the critical theory desires. It's a, sh it's a Schengen system built by the European Union. It started, it's based on the Schengen Agreement built on 1985, June, uh, 4th of June. And it promised a gradual abolition of border checks at the signatory's common borders. But yes, in, it, the meaning that it contains is, is the partial but not complete mat materialization of the thin cosmopolitan community based on discourse ethics. And it also is kind of trial to, trial, to folk, trial to build kind of reliance through discussion and conversations. But it shows a kind of limitation in the, during a refugee crisis that it is still not free from a kind of mood of exclu 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 exclusiveness towards people who do not belong to the Schengen system. And it means that it's not an ultimate form of cosmopolitan community based on discourse ethics. And well, this is the end for our case study. And Jesus is going to continue presentation for <laughs> our own opinions and conclusion for our research. Thank you. OK, so um, but this is kind of our thought process as we were discussing critical theory. Because uh, when we were done reading, and I assume you all read the core reading, although I'm probably lying to myself. Um, what we, because it, it was a pretty dense reading, and so at the beginning we were thinking, okay, what does critical theory even mean? Because as the reading went on, I don't know if most of you noticed, but we was just eventually discussed like the role of states, how the state is a hegemon of itself, how states as a political community are very good, and how we can like become better at them, and so then we inevitably fell into the pattern of that. Well, you know, especially when we got to the thin cosmopolitanism part, we were thinking, okay, this is not, this can't happen. This is not a thing that could ever be implemented into the real world. I mean, it criticizes the world, and yet it does nothing to offer viable solutions and alternatives. And so these counter-hegemonic forces that Hyunwon was explaining about right now, I mean, rest the coalition of the third world with the nine ally movement, et cetera, we were thinking there is no way that we can apply these into, a, like, especially into a world that's been so dominated by realism and liberalism for the past, say, 30 or 40 years. But then we became a bit more positive as time, as time went by in our discussions. We became a lot more optimistic. And so eventually we're like, no, wait, this kind of makes sense. Because all these examples he was giving you were kind of trying to show you and highlight how there is an applicability in the real world, especially the Schengen system example, how that is an example of how cosmopolitanism is possible, at least within the framework of a single continent. However, the refugee crisis is a perfect example of how when instigated by outside forces, it's less likely that this cosmopolitanism can hold up. You know, you'll accept people who are like you, but not people who are so different from you that you don't want them anymore. So it kind of does make sense. And so eventually we got to the point where we were thinking, okay, so how to apply cosmopolitanism in the world, we have to apply discourse ethics. And that's when we kind of struck like gold eventually, which meant that how do we apply discourse ethics into the real world and how can we differentiate between something that is possible within critical theory, you know, within that framework, and something that's just completely unrealistic. And that's kind of where our criticism of critical theory ended up happening in. First of all, it's subjective versus ob objective. Most people look at, you know, subjectivity and think, oh, it's a good thing because it's self-reflection. You know, like you look at critical theory and you imagine, and because it's critical of itself as well, and critical of the world around it, you would think, oh, that's a good thing. But because of the way it's structured, critical theory also has, as you'll see in the next slide, it has an agenda. It seeks to establish the world into the way it wants you to see the world. It wants to emancipate you from the shackles of, you know, 
the negative freedom, which essentially means that it just wants you to like stem away from like our current understanding of state sovereignty, and so that we're all just you know more connected and united than we are. We want to beat injustice. That's this. That's what critical theory wants you to do. The problem with this is that because it's so subjective, and because it doesn't have like as the second point is the lack of ethics. It doesn't have also the foundations by which we can define then what is injustice. In order to combat something, you need to understand where it comes from. You need to understand what it means. And so in the second point, when it says lack of ethics, how can ethical judgments be made about prevailing world order? If you don't have a moral foundation by which to question and emancipate yourself, which is the, basically the structure of emancipation theory, well, then you can't really argue or discuss anything beyond that. That's what like, my, my strongest criticism with critical theory was as I was reading the text, is that it was offering alternatives without pinpointing critical or uh, specific examples that could be shaped as something that you could say, okay, this is real, let's move towards this. It presented, it presented a theoretical framework that, while nice on paper, it failed to live up to like, any like, standards of ethics. And so this le to le leads me to my third point, which is you can't have your cake and eat it too, which is that... At one point in the reading, it basically said that Linklater was all like, states are too particularistic and also too universalistic. This is within the context of the idea that we should recognize the struggles of, say, and the oppression of marginalized people while recognizing that we're all equal. In other words, you should recognize that some marginal groups suffer from different kinds of oppression than other groups, and that we should recognize those differences, but at the same time, we should recognize that we're all equal. This is great and everything until if you look at it from a micro perspective. If you look at it in the big terms, in like big picture kind of way, it kind of fails to add up because no structure in the world can possibly hold up to the standard at all. When you have countries that, as you can see in the next point, when you, when you move into countries that have to deal with discourse ethics, which is like the application of where everyone has a voice, well, then that doesn't really hold up in the real world. For instance, imagine the concept of nuclear weapons. The threat of nuclear annihilation affects literally everyone, but who has a more important voice, the United States or Congo, a country with no nuclear weapons? Who is more at risk and who deserves to have a more important voice? This is something that critical theory doesn't answer us. It tells us that it's democratic, that it's inclusionary, that everyone that is affected by the problem deserves to have a voice. The problem is that it doesn't hi there is no hierarchy within those voices, and it does there doesn't present a framework by which we can say, okay, because these people have, because these states have nuclear weapons, they deserve a more important voice than the others. When that might not be the case for most of us, some of us might think, okay, just because South Korea doesn't have nuclear weapons doesn't mean it's not, its voice isn't important in terms of nuclear security, given that its neighbor is crazy. You know what I mean? So that's kind of like the great, that was kind of like a particular example of how this kind of theory can, doesn't hold up when, when you look at it with close scrutiny. And then we got thin cosmopolitanism in the real world which is like with no moral hierarchy, priorities remain unchecked and sovereign. In other words, the idea that because you as a state and with indiv individual within the state, like your priorities will always remain your own. Like this is kind of, this is a criticism within a realist, re realist perspective and I apologize if you're not realist, but it's kind of true. Like you are sovereign, you have your own priorities, self-defense, number one priority, numero uno. Okay, when you're not cosmopolitan, that's kind of like what you have to deal with. But even when you are within the framework of thin cosmopolitanism, because critical theory goes very into great lengths to describe this cosmopolitanism as thin. Like it's not complete. It's like we're hand in hand. We're not hugging each other. That's kind of what it's like. And so given that sense, how can you expect the sovereignty of one nation to all of a sudden just relinquish that power of sovereignty in the presence of someone else's priorities? No one would ever actually do that. It's so much more difficult to deal with that kind of situation, especially when you're dealing with real-world examples of militar mi militarization, someone invading another country. All of a sudden, you're m less likely to think, oh, let me relinquish some of my power so then we can all be best friends. And then in the last part, again, uh, just to reiterate, uh, critical theory has an agenda. It seeks to establish a world order that you know, is all good and everything. You know, it's a utopia by all means. But at the same time, the way it wants us to get there through thin cosmopolitanism and through discourse ethics is much more difficult than it's presented in the case study. It's much more difficult to achieve something like that within the narrative framework that it's telling us we should do it in. And I know we're not going to discuss it, but just food for thought. I know. Um, so, like, question one was, 
Should states suspend their sovereignty in case of extreme international crises? So in case of the refugee crisis, should all European Union nations just say bye to sovereignty and just accept everyone as it is? As we have seen, not everyone likes this idea. And then question two, who decides when humanitarian intervention is needed? Okay, we have accepted now that, for instance, okay, the UN decides, you know, for whatever reason, that the problem in Syria is an issue. But when are we going to decide when another problem in another country is big enough that it requires intervention? And should intervention be something that we need? Should states like completely relinquish their power of sovereignty so that people can literally go into their countries to fix their issues? Why should you need the help of somebody else to fix your own problems? Question three, are states the best political form of community? As I stated before, the state is a hegemon of itself. Like It controls every virtual aspect of your of yourself and your identity in that sense. And so should, are there better ways to form a political community? Believe it or not, the, the reading did not mention any new forms, so that's kind of another criticism of critical theory. And then question four, whose consent is necessary and whose participation is justified in decision concerning, for instance, AIDS or acid rain or the use of non-renewable resources? Again, this is just kind of a more specific example. Like in the case of, like, you know. Okay, actually. The main main hegemony that she asks about focusing on the critical theory is is the economical factors, which is based on capitalism. Actually, that there are many types of cap, uh, many types of critical theory, uh, which is uh, divided from uh, div like even the feminism, which is going to be presented, which was planning to which is going to be plan planning to be uh, presented presented next week, is also part of critical theory. But in case, but all the all has a common factors that this type of critical theory has is has a basement from Marxism. It's the Marxism, which is focused on the capitalism, as it is, it causes the uh, it, it change the composition of the core group and the periphery group, and do not let periphery group to grow and be in the core group. So the most important factor that you ask in the critical reading that the composition of the hegemony would be uh, economical factors based on capitalism and even the state is also the important factors but it would be better to focus more on the economical things. Yeah. All it is remaining is document. It has uh, 10 points which is represented as a document but is, if I put that document in this presentation I thought that it's going to be too long to explain about that so I just summarized it as the key point of that. As I said, uh, it's focusing on that anti-colonialism, and it completely against the imperialism have done by Europe, U.S. and U.S.S.R. And it's against the it's against the counter hegemony built by the built by the U.S. and U.S.S.R., which is represented as a Cold War. <laughs>